Section One of Captain Billy's Whizbang, Volume Two, Number Thirteen, October nineteen twenty. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Larry Wilson. Captain Billy's Whizbang, Volume Two, Number Thirteen, October nineteen twenty, by W. H. Fawcett open letter and skipping with the skipper an open letter the whizbang farm rural route number two robbinsdale minnesota to our readers with this issue captain billy's whizbang discards swaddling clothes and starts bounding on its second year of existence in this number which we have termed our annual the writer has taken the liberty to review many of the stories and poems from the twelve previous issues it is obvious that a new publication must start with no circulation if it strikes a popular appeal in the heart chord of human existence it succeeds otherwise it sinks into journalistic oblivion thanks to a legion of loyal readers and volunteer scribes the whizbang has weathered the colicky and diuretic stage of our life our eye teeth have been cut and the worst is over this little family journal of uplift has no one to thank but its readers it is your magazine and it is you who send in the snappy articles to fill its pages each month again we extend our heartiest thanks we are now spread from the mackerel munching macaroons of manhattan's bright isle to the squawking squabs of sunny california from the wily wicked polecats of northern minnesota to the perk and prim creoles of feverish orleans on this month the month of our birth the editor feels as happy as a kid sucking a lollipop and smearing its chin with an ice cream cone. All we lack to complete the illusion is about three fingers in a wash tub. Adios until November rolls round. Captain Billy. We have room for but one sole loyalty, and that is loyalty to the American people. Theodore Roosevelt. Edited by a Spanish and World War veteran and dedicated to the fighting forces of the United States past present and future skipping with the skipper just one short year ago under the above caption skipping with the skipper captain billy's whizbang exploded for the first time it was the publisher's idea at that time to compile a snappy joke book for former soldiers sailors and marines living in the immediate vicinity of the village of robbinsdale the demand greatly exceeded the initial press run and we've been running ever since for the benefit of new readers, the opening explanation for our existence on this mundane sphere is herewith republished. It explains itself, I believe. Whiz-bang! We're off, and in our trail follows a mighty explosion of pedigreed bull. Make it snappy is our motto. Snap, pep, ginger, even more. The first issue of Captain Billy's Whizbang is off the press, and with its advent the editor and contributors hope to have added something really worth while to brighten the atmosphere of human existence. Captain Billy's only an original whizbang will explode in every issue. No duds allowed in our monthly literary indigestion. Today we are the cherry sisters of journalism, with the fond hopes for big time sometime. As the old saying goes, laugh and the world laughs with you. Near beer and you drink alone. If we dance, we must pay the jazz band. No matter what we get, we must put up or shut up. Doctors of dope and doctors of divinity must have the price of our life and love, and the undertaker smiles with a self-satisfied grin as our mortal flesh and bones are delivered to the charnel house. Therefore, the motto of the whizbang will be, Be happy while you live. Live a full life, and while you are living, Live on the square so you may be able to follow that quaint Western philosophy and look every man in the face and tell him to go to hell. Please do not get the impression from the title page that the whizbang is to be a military publication only. There will be one hundred laughs for the serviceman and ninety-seven and one-quarter laughs for the civilian. We will give the soldier, sailor, and marine the benefit of two and three-quarters percent because we believe he is fairly entitled to it brewers please note the whizbang is only in its infancy so look for the november issue then we will burst out and explode into a full-grown bull 
we will be fatter lovelier snappier and juicier and oh girls we just hate to tell you watch for mr november and see if we don't make bill bryan's commoner drier than an algerian caravan in the sahara desert twenty miles from the oasic grog shop and the cliquot special two weeks overdue the bull is only half grown and he surely will be some lively animal next month when we sling him over to our readers those of us who have lived through the past five years have the satisfaction of knowing that we have seen the mightiest and most stirring five years in history and we are watching from day to day the unfolding and ending of the colossal drama never has there been such a crashing of empires such a falling of thrones such righting of wrongs and deliverance of the oppressed such vivid demonstration of the wickedness the folly and the weakness the nobility the wisdom and the courage of which human nature is capable as a grand finale an alleviation from the terrific strain billy's whizbang will come as a relieving balsam an ointment on the checkered skein of life please remember that the oldest truths are the freshest they are rich with the blood of humanity as the apple tree in your yard may be a sprout from the apple tree in the garden of eden so the idea that just came to you may be the same that struck king solomon thoughts are deciduous as trees and appear green and fresh to each generation and like desert soil we are unfurled and unfettered the editor end of section one section two of captain billy's whiz bang volume two number thirteen october nineteen twenty this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Kristen Hand. Captain Billy's Whizbang, Volume 2, Number 13, October 1920, by W. H. Fawcett. The Crap Shooting Major. By Skipper Bill. This is a story of a major in the Motor Mechanics Brigade signal corps u s army a c rebido by name he hails from the city of buffalo new york where he was employed in an automobile manufacturing plant and received his commission because of the supposition that he was a motor sharp soldiering and gambling go hand in hand the greatest indoor sport of the military man is to rifle the pasteboards while his outdoor pastime consists of blowing on a pair of galloping dominoes as he prays for a natural to rear itself heavenward. Rebideau is neither soldier nor gambler, but a dyed-in-the-wool squawker. The major's system was simple. If he lost, he merely issued checks on his bank at Tonawanda, New York, and then stopped payment on them. So simple, in fact, that his racial instinct led him promptly to the telegraph office to void the payment. The major relied upon military discipline to save him from his outraged victims. He believed that none would have nerve enough to make complaint against his ungentlemanly and indecent behavior, but at least on one occasion he reckoned without his host. That was at Camp Hancock, Georgia, where Rebideau lost $400 during several days' indulgence at craps. The victim, however, took the matter up with the superior officers. Rebido was traced to an air post far beyond the whiz bangs zone where he possibly imagined himself safe from his debtors as well as from the Jerry's. This is a letter which compelled payment. It was written by one superior officer to another and the commandant at the air post where Rebido was then situated. 1. It is requested that the commanding officer of AAAP No. 1 take this matter up personally with Major Rebido as the following are the facts of the case, as can be supported by the record of the Motor Mechanics Brigade, which records I have personally inspected. Several months ago, an exhaustive investigation of the merits of this case was made, and it was shown that Major Rebideau was entirely in the wrong in this matter, and was dropped on account of an endorsement he signed in which he stated he would make good the amount of these checks, approximately $400. 2. The unprincipled manner in which Mr. Rebideau now treats this matter is considered so reprehensible that effort is being made to secure the forwarding of the personal file of Major Rebideau, and he may be informed that unless this account has been settled by the time those records are received, 
that this office will make all efforts to have Major Rebideau brought to trial as a result of his derelictions. Needless to say, Major Rebideau cowered before the eye of his superior officer and forthwith repaid the broken pledge. I look back on my day in the ranks where a man was a man, true blue and shorn of falsity, insolence, domineering, and double-crossing ways. They were the days when we got paid together, painted the town together, and went broke together, where every man shot square with his buddy. As for this crap-shooting major, he is in civvies again, and military discipline will afford him no protection for such breaches. Willie and Molly played in the sand, indulging in youthful folly. The sun was hot on Willie's back, and the sand was hot to Molly. Twas ever thus. Every time we see an article offered at an uncommonly low price, whether it be shoes, prunes, fountain pens, wood blocks, or a personal service of some kind, we are reminded of Chief Big Smoke. The owner of this picturesque name was a copper-colored native employed as a missionary to his fellow smokes out in Oklahoma. A tourist once asked him what he did for a living. Oomph, said Big Smoke, me preach em. That's so. What do you get for preaching? Me get ten dollars a year. Well, commented the white man, that's damn poor pay. Oomph, replied Big Smoke, me damn poor preacher. The Eternal Feminine Women want marriage and a home. They should. And there are more women than men. Even before the war, there was, in Europe and America, an extra sixth woman for every five men, and the sixth woman brings competition. She bulls the market and makes feminine sex solidarity impossible. And, of course, added to that is the woman who requires three or four men to make her happy, one to marry and support her, and one to take her to the theater and to luncheon at Delmonico's and generally fetch and carry for her, and one to remember her as she was at 19 and remain a bachelor and have a selfish, delightful life while blaming her. Mary Roberts Reinhardt Move Over Bridget failed to get up one morning to cook breakfast for the Smith family. Instead, she yelled downstairs that she was pretty sick. Mr. Smith promptly summoned his family doctor, who gave the sick servant a thorough examination. The doctor was unable to find anything wrong with Bridget. My good woman, he said, you are not sick at all. I know I'm not, Bridget replied, but the Smiths owe me twenty dollars, and I'm going to stay in bed until they pay me. Well, if that's the case, move over. They owe me fifty dollars. End of section two. Section three of Captain Billy's Whiz Bang, Volume Two, Number Thirteen, October nineteen twenty. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Captain Billy's Whizbang, Volume 2, Number 13, October 1920, by W. H. Fawcett. Golightly Highballs, by Rev. Golightly Morrill, Mexico. V.C. in Vera Cruz stands for Venereal City. El Dictamen is the leading newspaper. It has only four pages, yet whole columns are filled with advertised cures for scrofula, syphilis, locomotor ataxia, and all the rotten ills that licentious Latin America is heir to. The space we give to weather reports on the front page or to special news with extra headlines is given up here to nauseating advertisements. The first thing one sees as he enters the plaza are billboards, walls and buildings with sure-cure advertisements. L.A. in Latin America stands for licentious animals. In Vera Cruz, the principal male pastime is to talk about girls and not of God. From 4 p.m. to 2 a.m., men sit in the Plaza Portales, drinking, smoking, and talking about the women who pass by. The leading subject of town talk is girls, the one they went to the movie with last, the other one the night before, 
and the one they hope to get tonight. The people make themselves a sewer for immoral filth, court the devil lust that eats and burns up their blood, are spendthrifts of body and soul, waste their inheritance to purchase dirty, loathe disease, pawn their bodies to a dry rot evil, make themselves patients for lust's rendezvous, a hospital where their bill of fare is pills, not beef, and the doctor's bill is longer than the moral law they have violated. What I have written here about Vera Cruz morals applies to the rest of Mexico, where conditions are the same or worse. The Ten Commandments are little in evidence in the country, and free love prevails with the fruit of 75% of illegitimate births. A respectable bachelor is not qualified to enter society until several children call him papa. Few men are without a separate establishment for affinities. Honolulu. The Hawaiians are out and out in their dancing. They do not gloss it over and wear no hypocritical fig leaves. They do not throw masks or mantles over their viciousness under the guise of religious charity balls and philanthropic society parties. The hula is a hip dance, but the Hawaiians are not hypocritical in doing it. The dance is not sad or hippish, but one of joy. I have seen many dances, the Apache in Paris, Duventre in Cairo, the Can Can in Buenos Aires, and with money here in Honolulu one can arrange with a chauffeur or at a hula house to see a hula combining all these vile and violent exhibitions. It is a composite of the compost of all dirty dances, most delightfully depraved, innocent of decency and shame, the dancers being quite careless about the exposure of their legs, arms, and charms. What captivating indelicacy, so disturbing to the looker-on. But this is not the native hula. There is sufficient of the sun and volcano without it. The whites have taken away the native naivete and added their own nastiness. As a physiological study, the dance is informing. In antiquity, these antics were a religious service, combining poetry, pantomime, and passion. The old edition of the heathen hula dance has been expurgated, but Christian footnotes suggest more. At one hula house I witnessed an unscheduled fight between several sailors who had quarreled over the charms of a hula girl with the result of broken heads, hearts, and furniture. The native proprietor welcomed us with characteristic Hawaiian hospitality. We could eat, drink, and stay as long as we pleased all night, in fact, with his hula girls for company. I thanked him for his ancient, beautiful, and unbounded generosity, but told him I was married and a minister, although he seemed unable to understand why that should make any difference with me, since it made little to some of the local clergy and laity. One day at high noon, not night, I saw several native women bathing at Waikiki Beach, all they had on was a hollow coo nightgown that was as good as nothing when wet. Three white male strangers sauntered up from the nearby hotel, waded in, threw their arms around the girls, and were guilty of diverse familiarities. The girls didn't object to the conduct of the boys. I couldn't help seeing or thinking whether the fishes swam away or stayed and blushed all colors. Here was a freedom of the seas I refer to the Naval Board for diplomatic discussion. God's righteousness is like the great mountains. I often thought, as I marveled at the island scenery, that there are sermons in stones, but men do not listen. Summits preach high ideals and purity, but people are deaf, and nature's green only looks down on the mud and mire of lucre, lies, lust, and laziness. End of Section 3. Read by Rick Potenza, February 6, 2022. Section 4 of Captain Billy's Whizbang, Volume 2, Number 13, October 1920. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Captain Billy's Whizbang, Volume 2, Number 13, October 1920, by W. H. Fawcett. Go Lightly, Highballs, Part 2, by Rev. Go Lightly Morrill. Havana, Central America. Havana. Havana is a fool's paradise, a lunatic limbo for people with loud clothes, lots of money, loose morals, and light heads. It is the place where bad folks go to have a good time. The more disreputable a city is, the more popular it is to high society. I have visited Havana many times, and found the H in its name stood for hell, not heaven. On a recent sojourn, I asked a traveling companion what the state of religion was, and if Havana's morals were improved. Oh, yes, there has been a great reformation. He had scarcely made this gratifying statement when a young man came up to me and showed some vile postcards and postals which he offered for sale. This did not happen in a side street at night, but in Central Park at noon. Havana has reformed. The city has no segregation, but you may walk for miles along streets to the waterfront and find every other house with a seductive senorita at the door or window with extended hand or winsome voice urging you in broken Spanish or English to forsake the counsel of your mother's Bible. Regular saloons and concert halls had scores of the women of the town at the table sitting with motley men, while glasses clinked and phonographs scratched their screechy music. This was all bad enough, but the lowest hell was reached when I saw a woman standing in the doorway offering to sell a girl of about fourteen who stood by her side. At the end of certain streets, the police were on watch to keep the women off the sidewalks and to maintain an appearance of decency and order. Other places were unwatched and free. Havana has reformed. The sporting women of the town advertise in several of the local magazines where you find their photos, house address, and some such paragraph in Spanish or in English for the benefit of the American tourist. Tourist, do you wish a good house in Havana with plenty of women, pretty and elegant? Go to Hmm Street. No, Hmm. Ask for Helena. Go today. Here's another. Artistic Academy. If you want a place for pleasure and a good time, go to Hmm. Plenty of nice girls. Another want ad reads Ladies from all nations. And still another Violetta has moved to Hmm Street and with her Parisian arts welcomes the Havana public. Poor pleasure-seekers, whose law is fashion and folly their pursuit. Bubbles on the wave of pleasure, a tracery on the sand which time's tide will soon erase. Every year the siren voice of Havana calls, Come in your private yacht on the gulf stream of gold. Come with full purse and empty head and heart. Come, you best society that you may be seen at your worst. Come, all ye who would desert the temple of your mind and soul for this Circe's palace of fleshy pleasures. Central America Hamlet found something rotten in the state of Denmark, but it was sweet compared with what I discovered in Central America, the land of eruption and corruption, of dirt, disease, destitution, darkness, dilapidation, Despots, delay, debt, devilry, and degeneracy, where a conservative estimate makes 90% of the women immoral, 95% of the men thieves, and 100% of the population liars. While strolling about the sultry seaport of Amapala, Spanish Honduras, and thinking of Morazan, the great Honduran liberator, Two deceitful dames sought to enslave me. I was a stranger, and they tried to take me in, their home nearby. Fortunately, a policeman came up and warned me in broken English that these girls were always very bad to everybody. Each one took my arm, and I thought it was time to take to my legs and get away. Anticipating my flight, one of them sprang upon me, wrapped her nether limbs about my waist, and her arms around my neck. 
Thus, in broad daylight in the heart of the town, and in full view of the passer-by, I was attacked and assaulted. What a shipwreck of character might have happened had I landed at night! I hurried back to the ship and sought the seclusion my cabin afforded. The captain congratulated me on my narrow escape and informed me that on nearly every trip to this port native women of the town attempt to smuggle themselves at night on board to exchange their morals for the sailors' money. End of Section 4 Read by Rick Potenza February 5, 2022「Section 5 of Captain Billy's Whizbang, Volume 2, Number 13, October 1920. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Captain Billy's Whizbang, Volume 2, Number 13, October 1920, by W. H. Fawcett. Golightly Highballs, Part 3 by Rev. Golightly Morrill, Panama, Friendship and Love, She Quit the Union, Panama. The last time I visited the Panama Canal, it was closed, but the town was wide open. Former streets called straight were crooked, and some rescued territory had relapsed. Just off the main street, the scarlet woman in the red light flourished and flaunted, Posing as bar girls, these women came out boldly with the bar sinister of their profession, came with forbidden fruit from the Cocoa Grove, and exposed it for sale on West 16th Avenue, contaminating the young. The groves may have been God's first temples, but not this Panama Cocoa one. Here Satan conducts services every day of the year, and passion fruit is offered all who walk its thoroughfares. One finds all colors, classes, and conditions of carnality. The U.S. soldiers are the police, because the Panamanian police hate our boys, sober or drunk. And when our boys had a fight, the Panamanians beat them up. There are dens of high and low degree, full of filth, profanity, drunkenness, disease, and debauchery. I know, for I saw, and I saw because I was there for local color and it was black enough. Panama is famous for its canal, the wedlock of the oceans. But the city Panama is infamous, knows little of the family word wedlock, and its red-like cocoa light would make the fabled Daphne Grove wither up with envy. From the first to the fifteenth of each month, the U.S. soldiers receive their pay and spend a large amount of it here in wine, women, and song. In this pandemonium of profligacy, one may see at any hour of the day or night a brave soldier boy, intoxicated with love or liquor, sitting in a doorway with a half-dressed, bare-legged girl in his lap. These girls are okayed by an M.D. twice a week and pronounced all right. Our soldiers cannot leave camp and visit them without a card certificate of good character. After they have made a night of it, the boys repair to the House of Lords in the district and receive a bath and inoculation of anti-venereal dope. If they fail to take this treatment and are contaminated, they suffer more ways than one, being compelled to pay a fine. This is all too bad. Pleasures pure and simple should be given them at camp or in barracks. As it is, many of them are shot to hell before they ever go to war. If they have any extra money, strength, or inclination, they may hit the opium pipe, buy a get-rich-quick lottery ticket, or on Sunday attend a bullfight. A modern St. Anthony would find it difficult to withstand the temptations of this zone. More than one Pan-American religious conference is needed to make the moral atmosphere as pure as the city streets are clean. It is a bigger job to kill the devil than to exterminate the yellow fever mosquito. Friendship and Love What causes the majority of women to be so little touched by friendship is that it is insipid when they have once tasted of love. She Quit the Union A party went to the opera and occupied a box. 
one of the men saw a raveling on the shoulder of one of the ladies. He picked it, and it kept on coming. He pulled and pulled till he had a tremendous mass, which he threw behind the door. Some days after, the men met and talked it over. One of them said, My wife had a good time, but she cannot figure out how she lost her union suit. End of Section 5 Read by Rick Potenza February 9, 2022Section 6 of Captain Billy's Whizbang, Volume 2, Number 13, October 1920. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Captain Billy's Whizbang, Volume 2, Number 13, October 1920, by W. H. Fawcett. Heidi Tidy, Aphrodite. At present, partly owing to what is very modestly called barefoot dancing, a severe season of closelessness prevails, and the aforementioned exercises afford the public quite a fair idea of the most admirable spectacle in nature. That is to say, bow legs, knock knees, thick ankles, spray feet, shoulders scraggy or pudgy, knees bony or lumpy, and weirdly shaped legs. The modernist poets also have been seized by the mania for nudity, but let us hope that with them it is rather theory than practice. For the average literator is not usually a dream of form in days of thought. One mocking rhymester thus makes game of such poetic aspirations. All the poets have been stripping quaintly into moonbeams slipping, running out like wild picantes, minus lingerie and panties. Never knew of such a frantic, Belvedereian corybantic, hidey-tidy Aphrodite, stepping out without a nighty. One of these modernist bards puts her own fancies into the brain of an old-time lady, stiff in pink and silver brocade, as she walks in a prim garden, awaiting the coming of her suitor. She would like to leave all that pink and silver crumpled on the ground, for underneath my stiffened gown is the softness of a woman bathing in a marble basin. Thus, divested of raiment, I would be the pink and silver as I ran along the paths, and her lover, seeing her, would pursue till he caught me in the shade. A writer of free verse is more candid. It is herself she would disrobe. Since the earliest days I have dressed myself in fanciful clothes, she says, trying to express herself in this manner, but now she is weary of putting romance and fantasy into my raiment. She realizes that my clothes are not me, myself. Hence the stern resolve, I think I shall go naked into the streets, and wander unclothed into people's parlors. The incredulous eyes of the bewildered world might give me back my true image. Maybe, in the glances of others, I would find out what I really am. Doubtless she would, but perhaps not exactly as she means it. Wandering unclothed into people's parlors, if police vigilance could be eluded, might be a way of seeing ourselves as others see us since the owners of the parlors would probably be startled into candid comment, instead of, as usual, waiting until the unclad back of the visitant was turned. It would be a happy arrangement if only the truly symmetrical would indulge in semi-nudity. Such exhibitions are a form of female vanity, but if the average woman will but realize it, she owes any admiration she may excite to the saving graces of clothes. If she is wise, she will foster the illusion. As a poet of another era expressed it, Oh, the little less, and what worlds away! End of Section 6 Read by Rick Potenza February 10, 2022 
Section 7 of Captain Billy's Whiz Bang, Volume 2, Number 13, October 1920. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Captain Billy's Whiz Bang, Volume 2, Number 13, October 1920, by W. H. Fawcett. In the grip of a dream. The dreamer is with us. From early youth there comes anon a time when the sense of great loneliness and mysticism leads one out to the wilderness of the dream god. Conceptions of dreams and of love are two difficult tasks, but Robert W. Chambers seems to have made greater headway than other authors. In his book, The Danger Mark, he thus describes the feelings that passed over poor, troubled Geraldine. We're pretty young yet, Geraldine. I never saw a girl I cared for as I might have cared for you. It's true. No matter what I have done, or may do. But you're quite right. A man of that sort isn't to be considered. He laughed and pulled on one glove. Only... I knew as soon as I saw you that it was to be you or everybody. First it was anybody, then it was you. Now it's everybody. Goodbye. Goodbye, she managed to say. The dizzy waves swayed her. She rested her cheeks between both hands and, leaning there heavily, closed her eyes to fight against it. She had been seated on the side of a lounge, and now, feeling blindly behind her, she moved the cushions aside, turned and dropped among them, burying her blazing face. Over her the scorching vertigo swept, subsided, rose, and swept again. Oh, the horror of it! The shame, the agonized surprise! What was this dreadful thing that, for the second time, she had unwittingly done? And this time it was so much more terrible. How could such an accident have happened to her? How could she face her own soul in the disgrace of it? Fear, loathing, frightened incredulity that this could really be herself stiffened her body and clinched her hands under her parted lips. On them, her hot breath fell irregularly. Rigid, motionless she lay, breathing faster and more feverishly, Tears came after a long while, and with them, relaxation and lassitude. She felt that the dreadful thing which had seized and held her was letting go its hold, was freeing her body and mind. And as it slowly released her and passed on its terrible silent way, she awoke and sat up with a frightened cry to find herself lying on her own bed in utter darkness. In France, we are told, the English officers stepped about as though they owned the whole damn country, whereas the Americans walked about as though they didn't give a damn who owned the country. New York liquor spotters have discovered liquor in baby dolls. Well, that's nothing new. Lots of bald heads have been buying wine for baby dolls in New York for generations. End of Section 7 Read by Zachary J. in Boise February 3rd 2022. Section 8 of Captain Billy's Whiz Bang, Volume 2, Number 13, October 1920. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Doc D. L. Martin. Captain Billy's Whiz Bang, Volume 2, Number 13, October 1920, by W.H. Fawcett. Questions and Answers, Part 1. Dear Captain Billy, I am 15 years old and have a sweetheart who is just 18. He owns a fliver and wants me to go riding with him. Should I? Lizzie. Walking is healthier. Dear Captain Billy, I have a girlfriend who insists on writing to me and demanding an answer. What shall I do? 
Charlie, tell her to enclose a stamp. Dear Captain Billy, my husband is going out with another woman all the time. What can I do to keep him home nights? Mrs. Brown, take the other woman in as a boarder. Dear Captain Billy, I am a young lady attending a church college. Do you think it would be all right for me to wear skirts 15 inches from the ground? Marie, that depends on your height. If you are six feet tall, it would be all right. But if you are only 29 inches tall, not yet, Marie. Dear Captain Bill, what would you call the unoccupied side of an old maid's bed? Simple Susan. No man's land. Dear Captain Billy, my daughter has a sweetheart who just got back from France. He talks to her in French and says, Via vous promenade, or something like that, and then they go to some park. What does that mean? Anxious father. That's all right, old man. Your daughter's sweetheart was only asking her to take a walk. Dear Captain Billy, what's good for cooties? Return soldier. Breadcrumbs. Dear Captain Billy, please explain the uses of saltpeter, Tommy. You are hereby referred to any soldier who will tell you its principal usage is in the manufacture of high explosives. Dear Captain Bill, what's worse than a cow with the cooties? Highball. A horse with the buggy behind. Dear Captain Bill, we are organizing a new lodge in Frisco to be known as the Ancient Order of Modern Cavemen. Will you kindly suggest a motto for our lodge? Yours truly, Rough on Cats. My suggestion is, catch em young, treat em rough, and tell em nothing. Dear Captain Billy, why do they use castor oil in racing automobiles and airplanes? Eunice, to make them run, of course, Eunice. Dear Billyus Billy, what would you write about if the country went wet again and you didn't have the dry reformers to poke fun at and kid about? Reginald Pewter. We cannot tell a lie. We wouldn't be able to write during the first few weeks. Dear Whizbang, my husband, a returned soldier, did not get home until three o'clock this morning. He said he was at the fort all night playing golf. Do soldiers play golf in the middle of the night? Worried war bride. Yes, worried wifey, they do. One of the favorite sports of the naughty doughboy is the game known as African golf. Two galloping dominoes are used in place of a small ball. Instead of the greens, the latrine floor is usually garnished with greenbacks and set off in silver. Big Dick and Little Joe act as caddies, and there is more cussing at a flock of boxcars than a minister foozling a putt. I indulged in a friendly game of dancing dominoes last night with my old buddy, Mr. Ader from Decatur. Jimmy Hicks and Long-Legged Liz were there, but before I got through, I had fever in the south and crapped out several points under par. End of section 8、section nine of Captain Billy's Whiz Bang, Volume Two, Number Thirteen, October nineteen twenty. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Doc D. O. Martin, Captain Billy's Whizbang, Volume Two, Number Thirteen, October nineteen twenty, by W. H. Fawcett. Questions and Answers, Part Two. Dear Captain Bill, please tell me what is golf. Ignoramus. Well, Ig, golf is a game where old men chase little balls around when they are too old to chase anything else. Dearest Billy. What's the difference between a bachelor and a worm, Andy Gump? Somebody told me there was no difference. The chickens get them both. Dear Captain Billy, I have been married a year and am the mother of triplets who are now three months old. 
My husband has asked me to take dancing lessons this winter because he says he cannot afford to have any more children and that dancing will keep one's mind off maternal cares. What do you think about it? Triple Trixie. Dancing's all right, Trixie, providing you tango in the morning, foxtrot in the afternoon, and hesitate at night. Fine exercise, I say. Dear Captain Bill, I am struggling with myself to keep from falling in love with a handsome football player because I heard that football players were so terribly rough. Troubled Tilly, move to the South Sea Islands where it's too hot to play football or else to Norway where the summer sport is fishing and in winter it's too cold to fish. Dear William, I recently met a cute little second lieutenant on the train and am very anxious to get in touch with him. He said his name was Joe Latrino and that he was in the sanitary corps. How may I find him? Winsome Winifred. Write to him in care of the captain of the head, U.S. Navy. Dear Captain Billy, what is the difference between Spanish flu and Spanish fly? Swede Harriet. Spanish flu is a disease. Spanish fly is a drug technically known as cantharides and is used as a plaster to cure rheumatism. Dear Billy, I am infatuated with a handsome young man from Akron, Ohio, but when he comes to visit me in a neighboring village, he acts so embarrassed and appears always to be in a mood of deep thought. Do you suppose he wants to pop the question but hasn't the nerve? Hellenic Helen. Now, Hellenic Helen, how in Hell's Gate or Helena do I know? Overlook his seeming taciturnity and remember that deep rivers move with silent majesty, small brooks are noisy as hell, and actions speak louder than words. Dear Dr. Billy, please give me the definition of the spinal column, slippery Liz. It's a long, disjointed bone covered with knots. Your head sits on one end and you sit on the other. Dear Captain Bill, what is meant by bigamy? Dandy Dillon. Bigamy is a form of insanity which causes a man to pay three board bills instead of two. Dear Billy, what's the definition of a humdinger? I've a hangover. A man who can make a deaf and dumb girl say, Oh, Daddy. Dear Billy is Billy, I was married last June and my wife wants me to obtain some polish in my manners, so suggests that I take music lessons. What do you think about it? Silas Hopkins. It's a very good idea, Si. You'll soon gain a musical education by playing second fiddle, but beware of the jazz. Dear Skipper, why is a certain species of beans called navy beans? Battle axe Liz. I don't know, Liz. You might as well ask me why I labeled the whiz bang an explosion of pedigreed bull. No reason at all. Dear Bill, they say there are germs on money. Do you think then it is safe for a poor working girl to carry her salary home in her stocking? Sadie Woolworth. Perfectly safe, I'd say. A germ couldn't live on a working girl's salary. Betty's better batter. Betty Botter bought some butter, but, she said, this butter's bitter. If I put it in my batter, it will make my batter bitter. But a bit of better butter will make my batter better. So she bought a bit of butter, better than the bitter butter, and made her bitter batter better. So twas better Betty Botter bought a bit of better butter. End of section 9. Section 10 of Captain Billy's Whiz Bang, Volume 2, Number 13, October 1920. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Kristen Hand. Captain Billy's Whiz Bang, Volume 2, Number 13, October 1920, by W. H. Fawcett. Seeing Los Angeles and Whiz Bang Bunk. Seeing Los Angeles. 
by Jack Andrews. Rubber necking via the Ballyho wagons has received a terrible setback in the beautiful city of the Angels. No more will the gossip hungry tourists be fed on the scandal of the movie colony from a megaphone in the hands of a husky voiced spieler. An edict has gone forth forbidding these caterers to whet the appetites of the unlearned and seeking visitors of Los Angeles to exploit the affairs of the celebrities in press agent fashion. Los Angeles officials contend that it is no nice way to entertain their guests where skeletons are said to exist in every closet in Hollywood. There is no question but what the moving picture business has a lot of deserving people in it, and some of the most admirable characters to be found are of the cinema crowd, but we have recently had a few stellar lights before the international eye in roles that were disgusting. Here are some of the utterances the city fathers say should be dispensed with. To your right, folks, is the home of Charlie, now used exclusively by Mildred and her mother, who is also her business manager. On your left is the home of Lottie, sister of Mary, who has a standing offer to fight any woman in the business. Jack, who is also one of the family, was living in the bungalow on Yonder Hill before his wife came back from New York. He left for Arkansas on the advice of his doctor the day before she arrived. He was also in the service during the war. Now, folks, this beautiful chateau on the right covering ten acres is the possession of an illiterate cowpuncher whose salary is greater than the president's. To your left is the former home of Mabel when she wasn't at Vernon and who is credited with staging a comeback after the star of Senate passed below her horizon. The one who was once called America's Sweetheart used to live in sweet simplicity in the white bungalow on the right. She used to be the idol of all children, but the page of her book is closed that the youth should learn aright. Is it any wonder that these rubberneck wagons did a thriving business in Los Angeles? It is said that each spieler tried to outrival his competitor, and from all reports the tourists were well supplied with scandal. Girls should remember that when they confide in a married woman, they are probably confiding in her husband also. Whiz bang bunk. As you show, so shall we peep. A shimmy dancer has to struggle for a living. Many a rough neck is hidden by a silk collar. Be it ever so homely, there's no face like your own. You can't feather your nest running after chickens. Keeping whiskey in your home is no crime. It's an art. Never slap children on the face. Nature provides a more suitable place. Close the saloon and save the boys. Close the garage and save the girls. Sign in dry goods store. Our woolen underwear will tickle you to death. A short horn bull. A man called for hair restorer at the drugstore. The new clerk gave him something to apply. In the course of time, the man returned with a complaint. He declared the stuff powerful enough for some purpose, but not to grow hair. His head was as bald as ever, but he was getting two big lumps like coconuts on the top. The clerk looked at the empty bottle and turned ghastly pale as he exclaimed, My God, man, I've made a terrible mistake. I gave you bust, developer. Gosh, all hemlocks. Listen, my children, and you shall hear of the midnight ride of a bucket of beer. Up the street and down the line, I've got the bucket, who's got the dime? What's sauce for the goose? A colored woman and her husband were conversing together when the latter happened to express curiosity as to the meaning of the word propaganda, which he was constantly running across in the newspapers. Well, said his wife, I is not sure, but I thinks I know what propaganda is. For instance, with my first husband, I had one child, and two with my second. You're my third husband, and we hain't got none at all. Now, I'm the proper goose, but you ain't the propaganda. End of section 10. Section 11 of Captain Billy's Whizbang. Volume 2, Number 13, October 1920. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Kristen Hand. Captain Billy's Whiz Bang, Volume 2, Number 13, October 1920, by W. H. Fawcett. Whiz Bang Editorials. The Bull is Mightier Than the Bullet. Is the theater becoming immoral? The majority of critics claim it is. The whiz bang disagrees on this point. We claim the motion picture development has stopped the sporadic growth of suggestive plays on the legitimate stage. The immoral, or at least suggestive, plays made their first appearance in any large number twenty years ago. Witness Three Weeks, Sappho, Dubarry, and others, and still today you will find these plays in oblivion. Together with them, the women who starred in such plays are almost unheard of today. Most prominent among these is Olga Nethersole. She was an English governess in the 80s and startled London with her portrayals of The Transgressor, Magda, and other productions of like character. Twenty years ago, Miss Nethersole shocked two continents with her Sappho kiss. She always maintained that playing the parts of these easy women would make her. Witness her interview of more than five years ago, in which she is quoted as having said, People have not understood that I chose to play prostitutes because I have felt it my work to aid the world by showing the suffering in it. If I had felt that I had not been chosen for this task, I should never have given my life to it. Do you know the story of Alexander Dumas the Younger? He was an illegitimate son whose father refused to wed his mother. Thereupon, the son gave up his life to the cause of woman and wrote his plays with the suffering of woman uppermost. Camille will live forever. I have felt that if I could show the suffering and the misery that illicit passion causes, I could do something for the world, could point a way toward removing the evil. And today, Olga Nethersole's prediction has fallen flat. Her name, or the names of her mimics, no longer are blazoned on the electric signs of Broadway. Olga Nethersole and the principle for which she stood are in oblivion. This is the era of keepers, too. Our collective national appetite has been entrusted to the keeping of four bills. I refer to Bill Bryan, Billy Sunday, Bill Anderson of the Anti-Saloon League, and Billy Be Damned. Those of us who once owned thirsts rapidly are becoming reconciled to the prospect of seeing about every other man in this country established in the role of his brother's keeper. Not his barkeeper, perish the thought, but the sort of keeper who keeps his charges locked up in an iron-barred cage and whacks them across the nose with a steel rod of sumptuary discipline, should they manifest a desire once in a while to indulge in a little personal liberty. It has become the custom for many police departments to resort to underhanded methods in obtaining evidence wherewith to bring guilty persons to trial for certain offenses, the plan adopted being the employment of what is commonly known as stool pigeons, go-betweens who act in direct conjunction with the police. Concerning those who allow themselves to be so employed, there is little to be said other than that they are not fit for decent society. It is a sneaking way of securing a living, and those who lend themselves to it ought to be ostracized by citizens who believe in conforming to the ordinary decencies of life. Moral reformers are altogether too ambitious. They want to abolish vice, but they cannot do it. Vice is not crime, although the two things are often confounded. The word vice literally means a fault or error. A crime is a deliberate violation of the law of God or man. Why should we be so serious and so violent in our attitude toward human vice? The root of the evil is in the weakness or wickedness of human nature. What is needed is to invigorate humanity with that moral strength which resists the inroads of vice. There are periods in the history of every nation when certain forms of vice are particularly flagrant. This was so when civilized Greece had lost her pristine manliness. It was so when pagan Rome was near her fall. It was so, unhappily, in England in the 90s of the last century, which saw the popularity of such literary and artistic decadence as Oscar Wilde and Aubrey Beardsley. 
Wise reformers will not ever deceive themselves by thinking that they can eradicate vice. They will try to lessen vice by moral suasion and by removing the economic causes which are the promoters of evil living. To put wretched people into jail is not the best way to reform them. It is better to make them see that a life of virtue pays better than a life of vice. This may be a low utilitarian stand, but it will appeal to those who are altogether guided by considerations of profit or loss. The alimentary canal of the business world needs a physic. It's the same in business as with the human system when things get clogged. We've been gorging the system of the business world until its tripe needs scraping. We've kept the hopper too full for a healthy elimination, and we need calomel and rhubarb for a change. Capital has allowed its cormorant-like propensities to assume the proportions of a boa constrictor in trying to swallow not only the calf, but the whole herd. Labor, following closely in the wake of capital and profiting by its example, has pulled the bridle off of the horse and started it down the road of reason for a head-on collision with a captain of industry, who is stepping on the tail of his big packard, and both will be injured. Cornering the earth and setting the price of all things required for man's welfare has come home to roost in demands for wages double and treble what they used to be, and both capital and labor must be purged of this overload on the liver of righteousness, or the undertaker will have an unusually thriving business very soon. The tendency of present-day writers and authors of fiction stories to deal in suggestiveness is perhaps explained in the popularity of the magazines which cater to these outpourings. Governor Morris is one of these, and who can say that Mr. Morris is not one of the foremost writers of the day? In his latest masterpiece, The Wild Goose, which appeared recently in Hearst's, he writes, for instance, One of the shoulder straps of her nightgown had slipped so that Diana's left breast was almost wholly bare. At her husband's next words, she hastily pulled the nightgown back into place, as she might have done if he had stepped suddenly into view. I could crawl to you on my hands and knees, he said, if I could lay my head on your breast just one little moment. Frank, she exclaimed, I am so sorry. But please, please, this is no time to discuss what's been gone and happened. Do go back to bed. Count the sheep going over the hurdle. Don't you know I'd do anything, 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 except the things I can't do? There was a long silence. Then the man spoke again. Do have pity, he said, for Christ's sake. Then we have Arthur Summers Roche, who quite often reveals much truth in his fiction. Writing recently in The Cosmopolitan, Roche, perhaps unconsciously, reveals a time-worn trick of the woman of the street in working a male victim. He writes, The difficulty with the waiters' union had resulted in the engaging of girls as waitresses at the Central. An extremely pretty girl had just served Mr. Dabney with something. Inspiration had come to him as he started to tip her. Worth just fifty cents, my dear, if I put it in your hand. Worth five dollars if I put it in your stocking. What say? The waitress essayed coyness, but failed in her endeavor. Five dollars was five dollars. She turned slightly to one side, her skirt was raised. Into her stocking top, Dabney slipped the five dollar bill. No invention of modern history has ever been acclaimed with the enthusiasm that greeted Mr. Dabney's strikingly original idea. There was a yell from Mr. Ladd's table. As explanation shot about the room, hilarity reached its highest pitch. Immediately, a dozen girls stood close to tables, while unsteady hands that held bills fumbled at the tops of stockings. Mary, Mary, quite contrary, how did your brewing do? It has the smell, and kicks like hell, but tastes like rotten glue. Pass her a palm fan. What sort of tree is that? queried a Chicago girl, touring California. Fig tree, replied her escort. My goodness, I thought the leaves were larger. A-W-O-L means, according to officers who ought to know, after women or liquor. Usually it's both. End of section 11. Section 12 of Captain Billy's Whizbang, Volume 2, Number 13, October 1920. 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Captain Billy's Whizbang, Volume 2, Number 13, October 1920, by W. H. Fawcett. Smokehouse Poetry, Part 1. The Passing of the Old Smokehouse when memory keeps me company and moves to smiles or tears a weather-beaten object looms through the mist of years behind the house and barn it stood a half a mile or more and hurrying feet a path had made straight to its swinging door its architecture was a type of simple classic art but in the tragedy of life it played a leading part and off the passing traveller drove slow and heaved a sigh to see the modest tired girl slip out with glances shy we had our posy garden that the women loved so well i loved it too but better still i loved the stronger smell that filled the evening breezes so full of homely cheer and told the night or taken tramp that human life was near on lazy august afternoons it made a little bower delighted where my grandsire sat and whiled away an hour for there the summer morning its very cares entwined and berry bushes reddened in the steaming soil behind poor girlie my parents told me not to smoke i don't nor listen to a naughty joke i don't they told me it was wrong to wink at handsome men or even think about intoxicating drink i don't to dance or flirt was very wrong i don't wild girls chase men and wine and song i don't i kiss no men not even one in fact i don't know how it's done you wouldn't think i have much fun i don't hunting the wily polecat as told by a french canadian i'm hunt the bear i'm hunt the rat sometimes i'm hunt the cat last week and tax my axe and go to hunt the skunk polecat my friend bill says he's very good fur same time good for eat so i tell my wife i get fur coat same time i get some meat i walk one two three four mile i feel one awful smell i think that skunk he's gone and died and fur coat's gone to hell by the time i get up very close i raise my axe up high that get him skunk he's up and plunk throw something in my eye sacre bleu i think i'm blind gee christ i cannot see ah run around and round and round till bumping goddamn tree by and by i drop the axe and light out for the shack i think about a milky skunk he's climb upon my back my wife she meets me at the door she's sick on me to dog she says you no sleep here tonight go out and sleep with hog i try to get in hog pen gee cry now what you think that goddamn hog no stand for that on count of awful stink so i no hunt the skunk no more to get his fur and meat for if his breath he smells so bad gee cry what if he spit the girl with the blue velvet band in that city of wealth beauty and fashion dear old frisco where i first saw the light and the many frolics that i had there are still fresh in my memory to-night one evening while out for a ramble here or there without thought or design i chanced on a young girl tall and slender 
on the corner of Kearney and Pine. On her face was the first flush of nature, and bright eyes seemed to expand, while her hair fell in rich, brilliant masses, was entwined in a blue velvet band. To a house of gentle ruination, she invited me with a sweet smile. She seemed so ready inviting that I thought I would tarry a while. She then shared with me a collection of wines of an excellent brand and conversed in the politest language this girl with the blue velvet band. After lunch to a well-kept apartment, we repaired to the third floor above and I thought myself truly in heaven, where reigneth the goddess of love. Her lady's taste was resplendent, from the graceful arrangement of things, from the pictures that stood on the bureau, to the little bronze cupid with wings. But what struck me most was an object, designed by an artistic hand. T'was the costly layout of a hop fiend, and that fiend was my blue velvet band. On a pile of soft robes and pillows, she reclined, I declare, on the floor. Then we both hit the pipe, and I slumbered, and ponder it over and o'er. Tis months since the craven arm grasped me, and in bliss did my life glide away. From opium to dipping and thieving, she artfully led day by day. One evening, coming home wet and dreary, with the swag from a jewellery store, I heard the soft voice of my loved one as I gently opened the door. If you will give me a clue to convict him, said a stranger in tone soft and grand, you'll then prove to me that you love me. It's a go, said my blue velvet band. Ah, how my heart filled with anger, at woman so fair, false and vile, and to think that I once true adored her, brought to my lips a mock smile. Ill-gotten gains we had squandered, and my life was hers to command. Betrayed and deserted for another, could this be my blue velvet band? Just a few moments before I was hunted, by the cops who wounded me too, and my temper was none of the sweetest, as I swung myself into their view. And the copper, not liking the glitter of the forty-five colt in my hand, hurriedly left through the window, leaving me with my blue velvet band. Had she been true when I met her, great future for us was in store. For I was an able mechanic, and honest and square to the core. What happened to me I will tell you. I was ditched for a desperate crime. There was hell in a bank about midnight, and my pal was shot down in his prime. As a convict of hard reputation, ten years of hard grind did I land, and I often thought of the pleasures... I had with my blue velvet band. One night as bedtime was ringing, I was standing close to the bars, I fancied I heard a girl singing, far out in the ocean of stars. Her voice had the same touch of sadness, I knew that but one could command. It had the same thrill of gladness as that of my blue velvet band. Dear pals, when my hitch is completed, back to Frisco I'll journey again, where my chances are worth a few dollars, all the way from a thousand to ten. Once again I will try to live honest, though I go to some far distant land, and bid adios to dear Frisco, and the girl with the blue velvet band. End of section twelve Recording by Alan Mapstone Section 13 of Captain Billy's Whizbang, Volume 2, Number 13, October 1920 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Captain Billy's Whizbang, Volume 2, Number 13, October 1920, by W. H. Fawcett. Smokehouse Poetry, Part 2. The Little Red God. Here's a little red song to the god of guts, who dwells in palaces, brothels, huts. The little red god with the craw of grit, the god who never learned how to quit. He's neither a fool with a frozen smile, nor a sad old toad with a cask of bile. He can dance with a shoe-nail on his heel, and never a sign of his pain reveal. He can hold a mob with an empty gun and turn a tragedy into fun. Kill a man in a flash, a breath, or snatch a friend from the claws of death. Swallow the pill of assured defeat and plan attack in his slow retreat. Spin the wheel till the numbers dance and bite his thumb at the god of chance. Drink straight water with whiskey soaks or call for liquor with temperance folks. Tearful stand at the graven stone, yet weep in the silence of night alone. Worship a sweet white virgin's glove, or teach a courtesan how to love. Dare the dullness of fireside bliss, or stake his soul for a wanton's kiss. Blind his soul to a woman's eyes, when she says she loves and he knows she lies. Shovel dung in the city mart to earn a crust for his chosen art. Build where the builders all have failed and sail the seas where no man has sailed. Run a tunnel or dam a stream or damn the men who finance the dream. Tell a pal what his work is worth though he lost his last best friend on earth. Lend the critical monkey elf a razor, hoping he'll kill himself. Wear the garments he likes to wear, never dreaming that people stare. Go to church if his conscience wills, or find his own in the far blue hills. He is kind and gentle, or harsh and gruff. He is tender as love, or he's rawhide tough. A rough-necked rider in spurs and chaps, or well-groomed son of the town, perhaps. And this is the little red god I sing, who cares not a wallop for anything, that walks or gallops, that crawls or struts, no matter how clothed, if it hasn't guts. Me for the Caveman by Charles C. Waltz I want a caveman rugged and tough To bite my neck and treat me rough To hold me whether I screech or bluff For me the caveman's stuff I want a caveman who can pick me up Slam me around like an ornery pup Out of his hand I would eat and sup Me for the caveman's stuff I want a caveman when I've the blues To take me and shake me out of my shoes To swear by note in lurid hues Me for the caveman's stuff I want a caveman just for luck I'll not be any sissy's duck I'm no honey or any such truck Me for the caveman's stuff The Profiteer by George D. Brewer When God made the buzzard, the toad and the snake, as well as the worm and the rat, he stirred what was left of the entrails and ends in an airtight asbestos vat. From this corrupt mass of intestines and muck he skimmed the most rancid I hear and took it away to a corner of hell and from it produced a food profiteer. Explosion of Pedigreed Cat With apologies to Captain Billy's Explosion of Pedigreed Bull 
a persian kitty perfumed and fair strayed out through the kitchen door for air when a tomcat lean and lithe and strong and dirty and yellow came along he sniffed at the perfumed persian cat as she strutted about with much eclat and thinking a bit of time to pass he whispered kiddo you sure have class that's fitting and proper was her reply as she arched the whiskers over her eye i'm ribboned i sleep in a pillow of silk and daily they bathe me in certified milk yet we're never contented with what we've got i try to be happy but happy i'm not and i should be joyful i should indeed for i certainly am a high pedigreed cheer up said the tomcat with a smile and trust your new-found friend a while you need to escape from your backyard fence my dear all you need is experience new joys of life he then unfurled as he told her tales of the outside world suggesting at last with a luring laugh a trip for two down the primrose path the morning after the night before the cat came back at the hour of four the look of her innocent eye had went but the smile on her face was the smile of content and in the after days when children came to the persian kitty of pedigreed fame they weren't persian they were black and tan and she told them their pa was a travelling man end of section 13 recording by alan mapstone section 14 of captain billy's whizbang volume 2 number 13 october 1920 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org captain billy's whizbang volume 2 number 13 october 1920 by w h fawcett Smokehouse Poetry, Part 3 Summer Idyll The dragonflies are on the wing, Oh, would some power command them To fly like any decent thing Instead of travelling tandem? Bomb, bomb, bomb We were bombed last night, We were bombed the night before, We're going to be bombed tonight As we've never been bombed before when we're bombed we're as scared as can be they can bomb the whole damn army if they don't bomb me chorus they're over us they're over us one little cave for the four of us glory be to god there are no more of us or they'd bomb the whole damn crew wild woman if she drinks we have taught her if she have smoked we showed her how if she has any bad habits what's the use to knock her now for god made man and god made woman both on a different plan so if woman do go wrong it's done by us the man it used to be booze booze you are my guest you often keep me from my rest you often make my friends my foes you often make me wear old clothes but as you are so near my nose tiver up pals and down she goes memory by oscar c williams when i review the days we spent up there upon youth's mountain top when we had thrilled to the throbbing of a love that god had willed and sipped together joyously the rare rich strangeness of the brimming hours and fair when i review all this those days so filled with life i realize how much was spilled we did not mind we had so much to spare friend wife here's to the girl i loved the best i've kissed her without her and i've kissed her dressed i've kissed her sitting and i've kissed her lying and gold darn her soul if she had wings i'd kiss her flying hold fast 
poet never trace the dream laugh yourself and turn away mask your hunger let it seem small matter if he come or stay but when he nestles in your hand at last close up your fingers tight and hold him fast robert graves sam's girl by charles c waltz sam's girl is tall and slender my girl is fat and low sam's girl wears silks and satins my girl wears calico sam's girl is swift and speedy my girl demure and good do you think i'd swap for sam's girl you know darn well i would good night you sing a little song or two you have a little chat you make a little candy fudge and then you take your hat you hold your hand and say good night as sweetly as you can ain't that a hell of an evening for a great big healthy man twentieth century jazz by carrie blaine yazer i ain't a coming back till i know why i ain't a gonna live where i have to die man drifts to earth like a summer cloud next comes the hearse and a linen shroud nailed in a box served to the worms without being consulted nor asked to make terms this thing a living and dying again is the same as a hog cooped up in a pen he's got just so long to wallow in swill so he grunts about never getting his fill then his light he puts out and he's served in chops on a linen cloth to a bunch of wops so i won't be squeezed into a body again till i know the wherefore why and when and i reckon time i grow that wise i'll be heading for the gates of paradise the answer why is it folks are drinking more since prohibition than before the reason's easy to perceive the same old snake that tempted eve with the forbidden fruit to play is on the job again to-day and pious folk who never took a drop in all their lives now look upon the wine when it is red because it is prohibited the old dog i've led a wild life i've earned all i spent i've paid all i borrowed i've lost all i lent i loved a woman and then came the end get a good dog boys he'll be your friend end of section fourteen recording by alan mapstone section fifteen of captain billy's whizbang Volume 2, Number 13, October 1920. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Captain Billy's Whizbang, Volume 2, Number 13, October 1920 by w h fawcett pasture potpourri and limericks a bumblebee backed up to me and pushed when things come to a head it will be some tale she i'll have you understand i got my musical education from abroad he i got worse than that from abroad it isn't what you used to was. Here's to the man of forty and past, Who's lived his young life and lived it fast, And here's to his wife of twenty-four, Who kisses him sweetly and coaxes for more. But all that he'll do is to buzz and buzz, And tell what a guy he used to was. Oi, oi, Ikey, I've got a joke on you. You forgot to pull your window curtain down last night, and I could see you and your wife all the time. No, no, Abby, the joke's on you. I wasn't home at all last night. When I was young and had some sense, 
I tried to jump a barbed wire fence. Mascot. Kissing a woman is like taking olives out of a bottle. Get the first one, and the rest come easy. That famous lullaby. Sleep, baby, sleep, your mamma's pet. Though your father voted dry, you were always wet. It has been said that the only possible way to get some men to the front is by kicking them in the rear, which reminds us of the Russian Jewish battalion in the recent Polish invasion that was cut off in the front while running to the rear. A few months ago the girls ran away from a drunken man. Now they run after him to see where he got it. You tell em, locomotive, you've got a tender behind you. Arabella. Children are such an expense nowadays. I don't see why you have so many. Mrs. Murphy. Well, you know, there are moments in the lives of all great men when they don't care a darn for expenses. Born in Kentucky, raised in Tennessee, won't somebody come and shimmy with me? Shakespeare. Young Blood, arrested in St. Paul on trial. Police judge. Who brought you here? Young Blood. Two policemen. Judge. Drunk, I suppose. Young Blood. Yes, both of them. Father said, my boy, when I was your age, down on the farm, I retired with the chickens. Son replied, That's nothing, Dad, so do I. She may be a moonshiner's daughter, but I love her still. Oh, my daddy's in the back yard, a sawing a log, baby's in the cradle, a walking the dog. Oh, honey, how long must I wait? Shall I get you now, or must I hesitate? Say a kind word for Patrick O'Toole. He borrowed a feather to tickle a mule. Here's to the girl with the high heel shoes, who eats my lobsters and drinks my booze, and taxes home to mother to snooze. I'll marry her yet too obvious. Sunday school teacher. Which bird did Noah send out of the ark to find out what the weather was like? Small girl. Please, teacher, a weathercock. Foolish rhymes. There was a young lady from France who got on the train by chance. Along came her sister who immediately kissed her, and the brakey went off in a trance. It is never too hot to dance if you are that young. Limericks A beautiful queen named Miss Astor wore a bathing suit tight as a plaster. She sneezed a big sneeze and felt a cool breeze, and knew she had met with disaster. There was an old fellow named Fife who had a most wonderful wife, but he went to the follies and winked at the dollies, and now she is off him for life. There was a young lady from Natchez, who fell in some nettle-weed patches. With a heart full of gloom she sits in her room and scratches and scratches and scratches. A giddy old maid, Miss O'Hare, caught a man in her room unaware. Come from under the bed, she emphatically said, and escape from this room if you dare. A doughboy who'd just come from France, at the close of the girls looked askance. He'd killed many a hun, and from bombs hadn't run, but the skirts made his breath come in pants. There once was a girlie from Lichen, stood scratching herself in the kitchen, her father said, Rose, coots, I suppose? 
Yes, Daddy dear, and they're itchin. End of section fifteen. Read by Ron Altman. Section sixteen of Captain Billy's Whizbang, Volume two, number thirteen, October nineteen twenty. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Captain Billy's Whizbang, Volume 2, Number 13, October 1920, by W. H. Fawcett. Classified Ads Maybe he liked stewed oxtail. Sign on Minnesota Farmer's Fence. Notice, if any man's or woman's cows gets into these here oats, his or her tail will be cut off as the case may be. Honesty in Advertising. Sign, Casey's Store, Golden Valley, Minnesota. Annual sale on now. Don't go elsewhere and be cheated. Come here. Everybody likes a sailor. From the Southampton Times. Wanted by a respectable girl. Her passage to New York. Willing to take care of children and a good sailor. Preparing for the flood. From the Elton Eagle. Wanted. Small cottage for a small family with good drainage. Why the streetcar stalled from the Dubuque News. Will the person who took pair of pants off Main Street car Friday please return to this office? Why the car from the Buffalo Courier. Wanted permanent gentleman border with or without car in Refined Lady's Own Private Home with Garage. Address, Refined Home, Courier. Fool in a Fool Cellar, from the Keokuk Gate City. For sale, a good modern house on the south side, with eight rooms and a full cellar, for $2,600. Van Papelendum Brothers. Power of the Press, Lusk Herald, owing to the lack of space and the rush of the Herald's prize contest, several births and deaths will be postponed until next week, or until a later date. Some prefer the rear veranda. From the Lakefield Pilot, house wanted by lady with large front porch and spacious rear veranda sun parlor, and no bedbugs. Unnecessary qualification. From Johnson, South Carolina, leader. Wanted. Girls to strip in a tobacco factory. If you lamp any, let us know. From the Philadelphia Ledger. Watches for women of superior design and perfection of movement. Bailey, Banks, and Biddle Company. New Fashioned Men Apply from the Detroit Free Press. Room with two meals daily in one of the prettiest private homes in city for one permanent gentleman with every convenience imaginable. What's the fare? From Petaluma, California Courier. I want to dispose of a lot of fancy chickens. Always home nights. End of section 16. Read by Carrie Adams, your book boys, at Mesa, Arizona, on the 5th of February, 2022. Section 17 of Captain Billy's Whizbang, Volume 2, Number 13, October 1920. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Captain Billy's Whiz Bang, Volume 2, Number 13, October 1920, by W. H. Fawcett, Just Jokes and Jingles. The Wrong Husband A lady boarded a crowded train and, rushing up behind a bald-headed man, kissed him on the top of his head. He turned to look at her, and, in an embarrassed and flustered tone, she said, I, I beg your pardon, I thought you were my husband. Your head behind looks just like his behind. The nice things of life are not always naughty, but the naughty things are invariably nice. In the Garden of Eden, Adam slept. Into his arms, a chicken crept. A voice said to Adam, This is Eve. And Adam replied, I've got you, Steve. When we hear a woman say that all men are alike, we wonder how she found it out. Little drops of water that we used to think were simply made for chasers are now the whole damn drink. Did you ever... A furrier was selling a coat to a woman customer. Yes, ma'am, he said, I guarantee this to be genuine skunk fur that will wear for years. But suppose I get it wet in the rain, asked the woman. What effect will the water have on it? What will happen to it then? Won't it spoil? Madam, answered the furrier, I have only one answer. Did you ever hear of a skunk carrying an umbrella? So you deceived your husband, said the judge gravely. On the contrary, my lord, he deceived me. He said he was going out of town and he didn't go. He was a rather feminine young man, but he got into an argument with his male companion, said the other fellow, Do you know a company in Cincinnati named a soap after you? No, is that right? asked the feminine youth in a high-pitched voice. What is it called? Fairy soap, was the reply. A young lady, on whose lap a bug had just lit, exclaimed, Oh, look at that funny little bug. What kind of bug is it? Her escort, That's a ladybug. Young lady, My, but you have good eyesight. O tempore, O... Wouldn't Omar Khayyam be sore if he was here? He'd change his immortal rubiat to this. Beneath a bough, a can of near beer, and thou. Here's another ditty from the Jazz Review. Coffee in the pantry, sugar in the bowl, mother's downtown, dancing jelly roll. She came down to breakfast very late, and her mother scanned her severely. Did that man kiss you last night? she asked. Now, mother, said the sweet young thing, blushing, do you suppose he came all the way from the Great Lakes to hear me sing? If the ocean was beer and I was a duck, I'd dive to the bottom and never come up. Negro Woman to the Drug Clerk Misto Drug Clerk, do you all exchange things here? Drug Clerk, why, yes, madam, we do. Negro woman, well, I was just wondering if yo would take back this here good-for-nothing rubber thing and give me a bottle of melons food instead. A girl's heart is like her vanity bag, overflowing with tender little souvenirs of love. A man's is like his pipe, carefully emptied after each flame has gone out. Second spasm, said the big red rooster to the little brown hen. Meet me at the smokehouse at half-past ten, said the little brown hen to the big red rooster. I'll not be there. In fact, I refuse her. Said the big red rooster with a smirk of pride. Huh, I should worry. I'll go outside, said the little brown hen as she left on a run. So will I too, you son of a gun. Footman, my lord, a lady waits without. Lord Wunkleberry. Without what? Without food or clothing, your lordship. Well, give her some food and send her in. Those Kilkenny cats. 
A story is told of an agent who accompanied a prospective buyer to the vast granite quarries south of St. Cloud, Minnesota. While there, a cat passed them and seemed to be in a hurry. The PB noticed it, but said nothing. In a few moments, another cat appeared and ran in the same direction. The PB looked at the agent, but he seemed to be paying no attention to the cats. When the third cat finally flew by and vanished in the distance, the PB could no longer withhold his curiosity. What in the world is the matter with those cats? he asked. Nothing the matter with the cats, answered the agent unconcernedly. But it's nine miles to dirt. Most women are pure and chaste. The less pure, the more chaste. End of section 17. Read by Toby on March 24th, 2022. Section 18 of Captain Billy's Whiz Bang. Volume 2, number 13, October 1920. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Doc D. L. Martin. Captain Billy's Whiz Bang, Volume 2, Number 13, October 1920, by W. H. Fawcett. Our Rural Mailbox. Yes, God bless him. Skipper Bill. May you grant me the privilege of expostulating to the tune of a jazz strain, which is indicative of life, the melody of the living and the nemesis of the dead and dying. Under the cloak of religion there are too many one-cylinder brains functioning to the detriment of our country, creed, and constitution, and the space you allotted to the vituperations of an ecclesiastic ass eclept Reverend J. Herbden Walters, was just two pages too much. Women have always been enigmas so far as man is concerned, and it doesn't require any brand of spiritual interpretation to convince us mortals that such a condition is in keeping with all his plan of things. No man who ever fell for the charms of a woman can point an accusing finger at her. When she makes herself sweet to look upon, she is but fulfilling her destiny on this earth, and the power of man was created for the sole purpose of battering down her resistance. That's God's law. It's the same in all forms of life. No, Bill, his dose is diuretic, and we are not seeing purgatives. His mentality is sadly lacking, and his virility could well be questioned. Personally, such festers on our social cosmos sort of rankles me, for I try to attune myself to the greater law. In closing, an error I sign my John Henry to these sentiments. Let me enlist the eloquence of Alexander Smith, whose brain gave birth to these lines. The saddest thing that can befall a soul is when it loses faith in God and woman one of the male species, E. W. Welty, 1819 West 7th Street, Los Angeles, California. Mary D. No, Mary, do not worry. Bank examiners will not inspect your First National. I fear when we reach that day there will be more candidates for bank examiner than for president of this good old USA. Nudes Gazubus. If you are certain your pet skunk has fleas, there is but one remedy I can suggest, and that is the tying of a good hefty chunk of dynamite to the tail of the animal. I've been up against the polecat of northern Minnesota, and the flea of dear old Frisco, and the devil saved me from meeting both at the same time. Beautiful Katie, this is the army recipe for hash. See that the dog is a fairly fat one. Hit him over the head with an axe and allow him to boil three hours. Chop into mincemeat and mix in a lot of potatoes, onions, and sage. Serve hot. Cats take only twenty minutes. Dan M. Should you accidentally upset a cup of coffee on the tablecloth, do not stare at it in consternation and exclaim, This is a hell of a note. 
laugh it off pleasantly, and apologize to the hostess. Daffy Dill, your question is rather absurd, and my answer is no. I have never heard a porcupine for its mate, but I have seen a gopher go for a gopher. Oliver Town, I can't quite agree with you as to the world's greatest historical event. How about the time that Antony made a date with Cleopatra? J.C.R. Yes, you are correct. The women's wearing apparel nowadays are held up by nothing more than a string of beads on one side and the kindness of heaven on the other. Happy Harriet, it is quite true that a tea kettle full of water sings, but who in hell wants to be a tea kettle? James B. I am not positive as to the number of years the government has been trying to obliterate moonshining in Kentucky. I do know, however, that they're taking in lots of territory now. Hubby, let's name our darling baby Prohibition. Wifelets, I should say not. He'll never be a dry. Some persuader, Brumbow, I can't see why Bert Kitchens married that ugly Miss Vanderpeel. Her money would not have been an inducement to me. Gimble, no? Well, her father's shotgun might have persuaded even you. Too bad. Pelican, did you hear about the arrest of William Jennings Bryan? Bellican, no, what was it all about? Pelican, for feeling out the women delegation to see if they were wet or dry. Or a second bill Sunday. A father wishing to satisfy himself as to the future prospects of his son decided to make the following test. Now, he said, I will put here, where he will see them the first thing when he comes in, a Bible, some money, and a bottle of whiskey. If he takes the Bible, he will be a preacher. If he takes the money, he will be a businessman. And if he takes the whiskey, he will be no good. Having thus decided on the plan, he arranged the articles and concealed himself to await the sun and watch results. Presently in came the boy, saw the money and put it in his pocket, took up the bottle of whiskey and drank it, put the Bible under his arm and walked out whistling. My gracious, exclaimed the father, he will soon be a United States senator. Dog on it. A farmer friend of mine was standing in the road with a gun tucked under his arm and an old dog at his side. He was directly in the path of a motor car. The chauffeur sounded his horn, but the dog did not move until he was struck. After that, he did not move. The automobile stopped and one of the men got out and came forward. He had once paid a farmer ten dollars for killing a calf that belonged to another farmer. This time he was wary. Was that your dog? Yes. You own him? Yes. Looks as if we'd killed him. Certainly looks so. Very valuable dog? Well, not so very. Will five dollars satisfy you? Yes. Well, then, here you are. He handed a five dollar bill to the man with the gun and said pleasantly, I'm sorry to have broken up your hunt. I wasn't going hunting, replied the other as he pocketed the bill. Not going hunting? Then what were you doing with the dog and the gun? Going down to the river to shoot the dog. Too many women look upon a marriage certificate as a license to operate a hold-up game. Pickled puppies. A lady entering a crowded train requested a little boy if she might put his basket, which he had beside him, up in the rack so that she might sit there. He assented willingly. A short time later the lady remarked, Sonny, I'm afraid your pickles are leaking. Little boy, disgustedly, Them ain't pickles, lady, them's puppies. Miss Marcella had a cat. The cat, she had a feller. Their backyard concert so annoyed, Ma made Marcella sell her. Speaking of society, we heard a good one the other night. A dude and his lady friend were tripping lightly back from the reception room when a rather stout lady, whose gown started somewhere close to the ground, 
and never could get strength enough to get any nearer to her shoulders, bumped into him. The dude was peeved, and said aloud to his lady friend, Like Balaam's ass, some people are always getting in the way. The fat dame, quick to retort, replied, You are wrong. It was the angel who got in the way, and the ass that spoke. Sayings of the Famous Rastus Johnson Mandy, the only thing that ever kept me a good man was your won't power and my willpower. End of section 18 End of Captain Billy's Whiz Bang, Volume 2, Number 13, October 1920, by W. H. Fawcett